again, welcome to Shelter Rock Church Online. I am so grateful that you're here with us, joining us today. My name is JC, I'm one of the pastors here at Shelter Rock Church. Uh, you know, we are just entering into the fall season and I, for one, am really, really excited. And it's not just the fact that I get to wear sweaters now. Uh, I, I just something about the season. It's something about the smells. It's something about the colors. It's something about just the walking down the streets. It's something in the air. I don't know what it is. The fall is my favorite season. Uh, I, every year I look to try to do better than a year before about, I don't know, going for walks or or checking out new places on Long Island, like where, where I'm at from. Uh, I, there's just something about it. Uh, I, I try to take my kids out and they are frustrated with me and they're probably too old to be taking apple picking at this point. They're all teenagers, but I still try to do it. It is something about this season. You know, I wonder from your vantage point, what, what is your favorite season and what does your, what, th what does this season bring for you? Is it, is it joy? Is it sadness? Is it, is it all a mixed bag of emotions? Would you let us know in the chat below? Uh, let me just share a story. You know, this week, uh, as I was just thinking about the season, we tend to be in a bit of uh, it's a mixed bag for us because, you know, soccer starts and and in and, and, and the church world, you know, we do tend to get a little bit busier and and, and I'm, I I'm, I'm have all sorts of hours and things are happening in our in our home life and in, in work life and my wife at work. It, it is busy, but I'm always trying to find space to get away and, and, and take it easy. And so this Wednesday, I was able to find a couple of hours and and so I just, my wife was home and I said, hey, do you want to go for a walk? And so we went to our favorite nature preserve and we were able to find a path in the back and we just walked through the nature preserve, grabbed a couple of lattes and went in and walked a couple of paths there. And I can tell you that it was one of the most refreshing things I've done in such a while. And so I, for me, it's the beginning of a really energizing season. And so I'm just so grateful I got to do that. So if there's anything energizing about this season, would you share that with us? You know, if this is your first time, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, in the link below, there is a, uh, a link to connect a Connect card. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. It's an uh, opportunity for us to hear from you, get to know your name, and for us to send some information your way about what's going on in the life of our church. You know, right at this point, we get into our, into, into a part of our service where we uh, sing some songs to the Lord. And so we'd like to invite you to what we call uh, a, a posture of worship. So we want to read a verse with you. It's called, uh, it's from the uh, passage of the Bible, uh, Psalms 108, verses 3 to 5. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples, for great is your love higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Let's worship the Lord in song. i 
together, come on.
So we've been talking about how Jesus calls his disciples to follow him. And we've been calling it the great invitation. What's unique about this invitation is that he doesn't just call individuals for one-to-one -one time with himself. Instead, he calls men and women into community to do life together, to follow Jesus together, to learn from Jesus together, to be changed together, and to be on mission together. Moreover, Jesus doesn't even call people who are like each other. When we think about doing community with other people, we tend to gather with those who are most like us, those who are in our own age group or stage of life, those who like what we like and do what we do and share our interests. When we think that community is about making friends, it's our vision. But Jesus' vision of community is more about transformation. So he invites diverse people with diverse backgrounds to himself. In fact, we see this in his group of 12. There's a tax collector, a zealot, and the rest are fishermen and laborers, all bound to each other because of one thing, a commitment to follow Jesus. And so we have this unique window of opportunity this week. Community groups are launching all across of our, our campuses and we have been inviting everyone this month to join community groups. And what are community groups? They are one of Shelter Rock's discipleship pathways. They are a gathering of people committed to pray together, to study scripture and nurture safe environments that foster vulnerability and accountability and care for one another. Community groups are an extended spiritual family led by ordinary people who live in everyday gospel community, engaging in the practices of Jesus together and living as missionaries within their network of relationships. This is where Jesus calls us to be. Jesus calls us to follow him into community. So our ask is simple. Each of us at all of our campuses are going to be asked to make a selection from one of our community groups that are made available to you to choose from. And after service today, you're going to get an opportunity to look at these options and perhaps make a choice. You know, my prayer is for you maybe to consider, maybe God is asking you to make one of these life-changing commitments to join a group to look at something around your area, to look in your region and to consider, might this be a season that God is asking you to join a community group? My hope is that that answer is yes, that you would join God or accept Jesus' invitation, do community with him. 
Say yes to community. Say yes to a community group here today. If you want to find out more about our community groups, you can go to our website at shelterrockchurch.com backslash community. I'm so grateful for all that's going on in the life of our church. Uh, and another opportunity that we're given here to worship the Lord is not only in song and not only in community, but we're also here at Shelter Rock. We also believe that, that, that giving is an act of worship to the Lord. You know, we can't outgive our Father. He's given us every good gift here on this good earth. And so uh, we consider it an, uh, a pleasure, an act of joy, an act of worship to give to the Lord. There are a few ways to give uh, online. And if you ever come in and visit us here at one of our campuses, you can give uh, while you're here visiting. Uh, you can give online through our website, shelterrockchurch.com backslash give. Again, we're so grateful. Now we're uh, going to enter into a time of word. And uh, today, Pastor Blake's going to be sharing uh, in a continuation in our series, The Great Invitation. And so if you would, uh, let's read in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, he, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Got my walking shoes on. I can't tell you where I'm going, but I'm walking down this lonely road. But at least the scenery is beautiful And no matter what I do, I can't stop walking, no oh, I know it's the only way to go And if I keep walking, I'ma be okay, oh. It's not always about knowing why Sometimes it's all about knowing what And that's enough to keep you walking every day Yeah, I believe, I believe But it's a dream that I ain't seen yet Chasing a dream that I ain't dream yet But I'ma meet it halfway If I keep on walking, walking, walking If I keep on walking up Yeah, I know it when I see it walking, walking, walking When I see it walking up Walking shoes, walking shoes Step, two, step, two, step, three, step, one Well, hello, Shelter Rock family and welcome to all of our new family or first time digital guests. My name is Blake and I serve as one of the pastors on the team and it is good to be with you today. Before we get into our teaching, I wanna give a big shout out to all of our staff, our volunteers and servant leaders that make every Sunday, every week happen here at Shelter Rock. Without you, ministry just doesn't happen. So thank you so much for responding to Jesus's invitation to follow him on mission to reach New York City and Long Island with the gospel. We are so grateful for you. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina, the most devastating natural disaster this country has ever seen, hit the Gulf Coast. And much like 9-11 here in New York, it changed life for people in that area forever. I want you to imagine 155 mile per hour winds, flooding everywhere, over 30 feet of storm surging water, many cities completely underwater. The entire region was wrecked. Some cities completely destroyed and families trapped on the roof of their homes with alligators and debris and all kinds of flammable chemicals in the water surrounding them. People even passed. Families like three-year-old Lachey Brown with her mom and, and dad along with her four siblings were trapped on the roof of their home for days with no help in sight until a United States Air Force pararescuer named Mike Maroney, who was battling PTSD at the time, was a week into his rescue mission in New Orleans when he saw the urgent need of this girl and her family, and he was lured from a helicopter on the roof. And even while battling with his own personal struggles, Master Sergeant Maroney put himself in harm's way. He put his life on the line, and with a sense of urgency, he responded to the invitation to go on mission to serve and rescue people that he didn't even know. No one had to coerce him. 
No one had to force him. He willingly responded to the call. He saw the great need and moved with urgency. At this point, you might be saying to yourself, this sounds like a moving story, but what does this have to do with our teaching this week? I'm so glad you asked. In many ways, Lachey Brown and her family's story represent the stories of people that we know and love and people that we live around, work with, go to school with, even people we don't even know. Human beings who are made in the image of God but are now separated from God, alienated from the life of God, the help of God, and the hope found in Jesus, who is the only one who can supply everything that we truly need. While Sergeant Maroney's story his response is a perfect example of what it looks like for the people of God, both you and I, to see this urgent need and to hear Jesus' invitation to come, follow him, to be changed by him, and to go on mission with him, to seek and to rescue people who are trapped in life without him as he transforms us to be more like him. This is where we find ourselves in our text today. It's let's do something about it day. It's let's not just say we're disciples of Jesus and do nothing but go to church or just go about our day. It's let's truly be disciples of Jesus by responding to his great invitation to come, follow him, and let him transform us into people who bring more people to him. Now, in our text today, we have already seen that what it means to be a disciple of Jesus is to be a person that comes to Jesus, follows Jesus, is being changed by Jesus, and is on mission with Jesus. This week, we get to learn from Jesus' first disciples how we should respond to Jesus' great invitation to come and follow him. As we look at their responses, I want us to see that we should respond in these two ways. We should respond with urgency. And we should respond sacrificially. But first, we should respond with urgency. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, it says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. In verse 19, the text says that immediately they left their nets. And again, in verse 22, immediately they left the boat and their father. Jesus gives the invitation and they responded with urgency. Here, Matthew, the gospel writer, uses the word euthaos, which means immediately or at once, which captures this language of urgency. It's the same language that is used in Mark chapter 7 when Jesus puts his fingers in, in a deaf man's ears who could hardly speak and immediately his ears were opened. It's the same language that is used in Luke chapter 5 where Jesus touches a man with leprosy and immediately the leprosy left him. Or in John chapter 5 where Jesus says to a man who could not walk, get up and at once the man was healed. This is the language that is used time and time again in the ministry of Jesus to display the urgency of Jesus' work. In the same way, it is used in this situation to emphasize the disciples recognizing and responding with urgency to Jesus' invitation. But we don't know for sure why the disciples responded this way. The best we can do is draw from what we know about both the beauty and the urgency of Jesus' invitation as well as the deepest needs of the disciples themselves and all of God's people. Perhaps they were drawn to the beauty of the fact that Jesus was inviting them to be a part of this new thing, this coming of the kingdom of God on earth where God is gathering his people from all over the world and Jesus has chosen them to be a part of that mission. It's like a king inviting you to be a part of his royal cabinet to help him advance and build his kingdom. If you think about it, there would be many great and desirable things that would come with this kind of opportunity. I mean, at some point you would be living the good life, right? You would have great impact, a great influence or favor or privilege. But how about the joy of the opportunity just to be close to the king? Maybe this is what they were drawn to. Or maybe they were drawn to the fact that they had an urgent need for salvation themselves. That only Jesus the Messiah could give. 
And in the same breath, perhaps they were drawn to the urgent need that all of their people, God's people, have of a savior, the only one who can rescue them and us from being trapped in a life without God in it. Like maybe they saw themselves and everyone that they knew and loved as trapped in a house that is burning down or a boat that is going under with no life jacket, no rescue boat. And Jesus is the only one that can pull them out. We just don't know for sure. But even though we don't know for sure, what we do know is that both illustrate clear pictures of what a life spent following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and being on mission with Jesus is like. On the one hand, we respond to Jesus' invitation to come and follow him because we have a desire deep within us to have a life that is full of moments where we experience great joy and peace and purpose, to have great influence and an impact and favor, and we just want to be close to God, to have all of the amazing joys of just being close and walk in an intimate relationship with the king of the universe. And we find that only in Jesus. While on the other hand, we respond to Jesus' invitation to go on mission with him, to catch people out of a burning house because we see the urgency of our own personal need for a savior and the urgent need for the people that we know love and live and work and worship with. And so we should respond with urgency like the disciples because we have an urgent, desperate need for Jesus ourselves. And there are people that we know, love, live, and work, and worship with that have an urgent need for him too. And we should respond with urgency because we are drawn to Jesus. He's the only way that we could have an intimate relationship with God and a life that is full of hope and, and joy and peace and purpose. It's through him. Family, I invite us not to fall into the trap of thinking that, oh, we have time. Or I'll get to that later. No, scripture says now is the time. Today is the day when we hear his voice calling us to himself. We should respond with urgency. We should say yes to Jesus' invitation to come and follow him as we move towards people, love them and serve them and be about the mission of bringing people to him. Next, we'll see that we should respond sacrificially. Again, Jesus says, come, follow me. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed Jesus. Again, Jesus makes the invitation. They respond sacrificially. As we learned in week one, Matthew uses his word, aphentes, left, which means to abandon someone or something, even beliefs. But this language of abandonment is not the kind of abandonment where we leave behind or let go of something obvious that we should already want to let go. No, not at all. This is a letting go of something that requires us to sacrifice. Something that we want to hold on to, like our comforts or some relationships maybe, or our valuable time, treasure, or trust. This is the same language that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 8, verse 22, when someone was giving excuses of why they couldn't follow Jesus. Jesus said to them, follow me and leave the dead to bear their own dead. It's the same language which says that in Matthew chapter 18, verse 12, that Jesus will leave the 99 sheep and search for one, the one who went astray. It's the same language that Jesus uses when he says in John chapter 14, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. This language captures the sacrificial nature of what it means to respond to Jesus' invitation to go on mission with him. In other words, there is a cost to do business with Jesus. You know, I'm sure we've all seen the sorry, we're closed sign before, right? I mean, if we're being honest, there are very few things more frustrating that causes us some discomfort or even flat out hurts us than driving miles upon miles after thinking all week and planning all week to go to our favorite store or restaurant or venue only to see a sorry, we're closed sign. Or how about working your whole lives to build a business only to have to hang a sorry, we're close sign over our own business. Well, this is what Matthew, the one who wrote this gospel, had to do. This is what Andrew and Peter and James and John had to do in order to follow Jesus. They closed the shop. They left the business behind to follow him. It cost them something to go on mission with Jesus. Do you think that they felt like it was worth it? 
even if they didn't know everything that it would cost them to follow Jesus? You know, I think that the closer they got to Jesus, the more time they spent following him, the more Jesus changed them. And the more they saw Jesus transform the lives of the people, they saw Jesus as worth the cost. In fact, I came across a quote from John Piper that I think captures what we all come to realize. The more time we spend with Jesus, even without all the details of what it would cost to follow him, John Piper says, Jesus requires commitment to the highest possible cost. And nothing later is going to surprise you then because you've already sold, totally sold, to the highest, most excessive cost. In other words, you don't need to know the specifics of the cost in your own particular case. If the agreement you sign is, I'm yours at any cost. Family, this is what it looks like to respond to Jesus, Jesus regardless of the cost. It's seeing Jesus as worth more than what we sacrifice. And so the question for us becomes, what is Jesus calling me to sacrifice? To go on mission with him, to catch people from the burning building, the boat that's sinking. Could it be some valuable time? Could it be using our gifts and abilities and experiences and even our treasures to serve someone locally or abroad? Could it be stepping out of our comfort zone and being willing to be uncomfortable for a season? Or could it mean giving up some control of our lives and completely surrendering that trust, that control to Jesus? Whatever it is, whatever that thing is for you and for me, we should respond to Jesus' great invitation to follow him sacrificially. But here's the good part. This is where what Jesus invites us to comes face to face with the gospel. Jesus never calls us to do something for him or for someone else that he hasn't already done for us. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 11, the apostle Paul tells us to have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Family, Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us because of our urgent need for him. And this is why the scripture goes on to say, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Family, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus rescues us from being trapped in a life without him. And the good news about Jesus' invitation is that he rescues us and changes us to be more like him so that we can join in his mission to set others free from the life without him too. Which brings us to Master Sergeant Mike Maroney who rescued, who willingly put himself in harm's way and responded with urgency to rescue Lachey Brown and her family for being trapped on the roof of their home back in 2005. For 10 years, he could not find the little girl that he said changed my life. Until a television show called The Real in 2015 found the girl and reunited them. This is Mike and Lachey after rescue and Mike and escorting her to her military ball 10 years later. But one of the most powerful things about this story is not just that Mike rescued Lachey. It's not just that she has grown up and is having a good life. No, it's the power behind what Mike made sure that he told her while at the ball. He said to her, you rescued me more than I rescued you. Family, this is what is like what happens in our lives whenever we say yes and respond to Jesus' invitation to come and follow him. Jesus changes us more than we change someone else. Jesus rescues us more than we rescue someone else. I want to invite us today to consider how Jesus might be calling us on mission with him. It could be placing our faith in him as our Savior and Lord today. For, for some of us, it could be joining a local church and serving there. It can be responding by going on mission with him somewhere abroad and around the world, or it can be as simple as being willing to be made uncomfortable and moving towards our neighbors and family and friends and even our enemies with the good news about Jesus. Family, whatever he's calling us to, I pray that we respond with urgency and sacrificially in Jesus' name. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you so much for Jesus rescuing the lost, those who are trapped and stranded, those of us who are trapped and stranded in this life separated from you without hope. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to our rescue and bringing us into a relationship with you that can never be broken. Jesus, as you call us, as you call your disciples to come and to follow and to go on mission with you, as you change us, Lord, we pray that we will willingly and sacrificially and with urgency say yes to the invitation. This is truly a great invitation, Father, that you've called us to go on mission to be catchers of people who are living in a burning house, who are sitting in a boat that is sinking apart from you. Help us to see that need and to be moved towards them, not to sit by and wait for someone else, but to be moved with urgency to see the cost of our time and even our treasure, even our trust and the control of our lives, to see the cost of that as being worth it, Jesus, because you're worth it. You're worth having those who don't know you come to know you and live in an eternal relationship with you. Help us, Holy Spirit, to respond to the call to come, follow, Jesus, as a way of life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Thank you, Pastor Blake. You know, one of the things that impacts me most about this passage is just the immediacy or the urgency of these disciples. You know, we read that they immediately dropped their nets. They immediately left their boats. They immediately left their father. And I just begin to wonder what, what part of our own lives is there a sense of urgency or immediacy to leave the things that are going on in our life to follow Jesus? What is your response today? Like, how are you responding to the call or the great invitation? I know when I was younger, when I first heard the response that to not only accept his invitation to follow him with my life, there were, there, were, there were multiple times in my life to respond to him to serve, to respond to him to lead, to respond to his call uh, to, 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 for, for many spaces in my life, to just be the person that God was calling me to be. There is some step that you need to take in your life today, and I'm wondering what that step is for you. There's plenty of time for you to take a step today. There's a QR code that uh, on the screen before you, a response, we're calling today Response Sunday, and we're asking for you to make a response. What is God calling you to do? Is it to respond to take a class? Is it for you to respond uh, to join a group? Is it for you to respond and come and visit the campus? Is it for you to respond to join seminary now? Is it for you to respond for, for, to, be, to begin a relationship with Jesus, let us know how we can come alongside you and whatever response you think you need to take to follow Jesus. Don't wait another minute. Respond to Jesus now with a sense of urgency, with a sense of immediacy. Do that right now. Don't wait another moment. Let us help you. Let us help, help you take that step today. And we don't ever want to close a, a Sunday service without giving you an opportunity to, to let us pray for you. So if you want to, in the link below, there's also, uh, in the bio below, there's a link to a prayer request form. If Even if that step for you is to say, letting us know how we can pray for you, we want to make that opportunity available to you. So you can click on the link, let us know by prayer request. And if it's a response, if today God is urging you to take a, a next step, we want to know what that step is for you and how we can come alongside you to take that immediate step today. We hope that God has been urging you to take a step to follow him in this season of your life. We love you. God bless you. We can't wait to see you next week.